Uh, so Zoe Garbett is a Green Party councillor in Hackney. Uh, she's leader of the Green Group on Hackney City Count uh, Borough Council, sorry, and is now, as of this week, the Green Party's 2024 candidate for London Mayor. Zoe, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Hi, Chris. I'm really good. Thank you. It's great to see you. And thanks for having me on here so quickly after the launch on Friday. It's really exciting. Well, thanks for joining us so quickly after the announcement. <laughs> uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, so let's kick things off nice and easy. How does it feel to have been selected as the Green Party's mayoral candidate? Oh, gosh, it's um, really exciting. I'm really overwhelmed with the support that I've received. Um, there was lots of support during the campaign as that was kind of building towards the selection and the vote in January. Um, but it was really overwhelming to get almost, well, to get like 51% of the vote to, on people's first preferences, which was, you know, the competition was really tough. Benali, Hamdash and Scott Ainsley as the other candidates ran really good campaigns and a really great kind of councillors, campaigners and ran, yeah, really good campaigns. So I just did, yeah, we didn't know how it was going to go. So it's been really, really exciting. We obviously had the launch on Friday with loads of coverage from kind of ITV London and BBC and stuff, which was really good. Um, we're the first party to get out our candidates, which is just showing how it kind of exciting this election is for us and what our kind of possibilities are. Um, it's been really good hearing from kind of residents and um, other people I know and organisations I work with, um, straight from the, um, just a little story, straight from the launch, I went to Ridley Road Market, and I know Ridley Road Market is kind of quite famous, but it's uh, it's in my ward in Dalston, and it's, um, you know, it was started in the late 1800s, and it's really, really kind of heart of Hackney, and, um, you know, like markets are across the city, and like markets across the city, it's kind of under threat of gentrification. So I've been working really closely with all the market traders, and I popped to see them afterwards and just explain what I'd been doing. And they were overwhelmingly supportive and really excited about the platform I was going to have to talk about, you know, some of the things that they're experiencing. So it's been really good, like, getting out and talking to people about it. So, yeah, it's really exciting. You mentioned the word platform there. Uh, so what are your priorities going to be as the Green Party's candidate for London Mayor? So, yeah, as we know, Chris, our party is extremely democratic. So we will be going through a really intensive um, process to write our manifesto and decide with residents, with our members and with community groups what those priorities should be. But the things that I, which I'm really looking forward to, and I really hope that lots of members get involved in that process because I was involved in it before and it's just brilliant kind of, creating that vision for London together and kind of imagining what a green powered London would look like you know our top kind of you know kind of values around kind of tackling inequality and getting more power for London and more power for residents and you know taking genuine action on the climate emergency and stuff like that but the the priorities that I spoke about during the campaign and the things that I'm passionate about and hear from residents and organizations that are really important are things like the fact we have um, a wonderful transport system but there's lots more we could be doing to tackle kind of the affordability and to kind of protect that and kind of make um, active and um, public transport more accessible and quicker and faster and safer for people um, so you know this builds on work the assembly members have been doing so this is about kind of freezing bus fares and making fares free for those under 22 like they have done in Scotland and you know really looking at kind of fairer road charging um, and then there's a, you know, that's part of also making London, you know, looking at making London kind of more affordable and accessible to people. Because what I hear a lot from people and a lot of, you know, a lot of concern I've got about this city is it's becoming more and more um, expensive. A lot of the casework I've got is around kind of people being evicted and really struggling to stay in this city. So another priority is all around kind of lobbying for rent controls, holding landlords to account. I've written uh, about some work around holding, uh, you know, making the landlord um, checklist that the mayor holds more accountable so that that keeps kind of landlords accountable for providing kind of proper good quality housing. And then, of course, a, an issue that's really important to residents is all around and Lon Londoners is all around um, the, sa the feeling safe and the accountability of the police. We've seen some horrendous stories coming out recently around the Met um, kind of attacks on women as well as like young the rights of young black people um, and I've been really clear on the things that have to change about policing and holding them to account in the work that I've been doing in in my borough role so you know that's all around kind of proper vetting ending child strip search and addressing the overuse and misuse of stop and search through um, deprioritizing the policing of cannabis so that's you know the greens have often been kind of the 
fierce, you know, the strongest lone voice on policing in the in the assembly. So it just builds on kind of what we hear from Londoners, but also what we're already kind of doing in our boroughs and also kind of on the assembly. So the 2024 mayoral election is going to be held under a different system than previous mayoral elections have had have been. So for some of our viewers, you may be aware that uh, in previous mayoral elections, uh, voters were given two preferences. So you could vote with your first preference for one candidate and your second preference for a second. And your second preference would have been taken into account if your first preference didn't make it into the final two, uh, the, the top two candidates in that election. Uh, after the 2022 Elections Act that the Tories have introduced, which has introduced a whole bunch of awful things like voter ID and a bunch of other stuff uh, that's really damaging to our democracy, one of the changes that's been made is that the London mayor election will be taking place under first past the post for the first time. And that has major implications for that election, one of which is that it may be harder for the Greens to perform well. Uh, because historically, Greens have been able to give, voters have been able to give their first preference to their Greens, safe in the knowledge that if the Green candidate doesn't come in the top two, their second preference will be counted. With that not happening in 2024 and with first past the post being introduced, what do you think realistically the Greens can achieve in the mayoral election? Yeah, it's really great that we're covering this, Chris, because it's really surprising to me how many people haven't realised that it's, you know, going to be run under this first past the post system and you're absolutely right in highlighting the fact that this is an attack on our democracy and lots of other difficult ways it's going to make for people to participate in voting um we are really proud of our kind of achievements in the london elections you know last time we went from um you know we, we got almost eight percent in you know sean Berry almost achieved eight percent in the london um, mayoral election um, and we know that first past we can win and we are doing well under first past the post, you know, some of our borough, res, you know, borough results and local results, you know, and last week in Bristol, and we've got Patrick on today. And, you know, it's really exciting that people are still trusting us even under that system. But you are right that, it, you know, it is something for us to think about and consider. And, it, you know, the, the new content, you know, the context we've got in 2024 is completely different politically in terms of where the Tories votes are and where Labour's support will be. And I think, this is our real opportunity to just stand firm in our values. You know, we do campaign for more proportional systems, so we can't just wait until those happen. We have to, you know, really platform our policies. And we know that people, you know, want to vote green. We got almost, Sean got the most um, second preferences in 2021, um, which was almost 486,000 or around that, yeah, around that mark, which is huge. So we know that there's kind of, you know, a huge amount of people who do have a preference for us. We just have to work really hard in this election to show them why we should be their first preference. And so the mayor election is taking place concurrently with elections to the London Assembly. And uh, alongside the mayoral selection process, Green members in London have, be, have, have voted to select their list for uh, the PR element of the London Assembly election. So the incumbent uh, Assembly members, Sean Berry, Carla Russell and Zach Polanski are the top three candidates on that. Um, and then yourself, you're next on the list. And Benali Hamdash, who is also a candidate in the mayoral selection, is fifth on the list. Um, so alongside the mayoral election, the Greens are going to be fighting a campaign to get more Greens elected to the Assembly and defend the seats that they hold. How do you think that you can use your mayoral candidacy to support the Greens in the Assembly elections? This is a really important part of this um, election because obviously this bit being proportional, we do, yeah, it's a real opportunity for us. And we obviously went up from two to three assembly members last time and we're really excited to run a really strong campaign and get even more Greens on the assembly. Um, we do know, you know, this is part of the building story in London. We had, you know, great success last year in the local elections here. We've got a number of boroughs that achieved over 20% of a borough borough-wide vote and lots more over 15%. So I think it's part of this building story in London that people are choosing to vote green. And that's, you know, it's that bit that we can push on the assembly vote. It will be part of the way we reach out to people and communicate with people and run a, you know, really kind of engaged campaign with, with residents and voters to make sure that they know why to vote green and what we're doing, you know, building on our credibility, explaining what the, you know, London Assembly members are already doing in the Assembly, they're holding the mayor to the account, they're pushing for green policies. Um, and yeah, and it's, 
you know, the huge part of the mayoral campaign is to go and kind of support those local the local borough campaigns and to really kind of help build build those campaigns which I'm really looking forward to doing I'm already going to Kingston next week to talk about drug policy but it's part you know I can now talk about the mayoral campaign and it's all part of reaching out to those parties across the city uh, helping them to, to build those campaigns because it will be in the boroughs where you know people are having those conversations delivering the literature and kind of increasing that vote share um there was an incredible number of people to choose from on the on the list lots of new people getting involved and standing in this election which is really exciting because we've also got the constituency bit where there will be hustings so hoping lots of those people put themselves forward for those vote and um, those so there'll be lots of opportunity for people to be hearing hearing from greens um and yeah i just think it's part of our yeah our growing story here you know building towards those local elections in 2026 and um yeah i just think it's a really exciting time to get involved in this this election so you mentioned the constituency element of the assembly uh, there, and just for viewers to explain briefly, so the London Assembly, uh, it operates with 25 members, uh, 11 of them are elected uh, via a proportional system across the whole of London, and the remaining members are all elected in sort of massive mega constituencies. Um, and we've got a question about the constituency element of the campaign. Uh, of the election that's come in from the chat. So Emma Garnett, who's coming up on the show later today, uh, has asked, um, which boroughs have the best chance to get a Green London Assembly constituency member elected? Yeah, great question. So in 2021, so obviously the election was delayed by a year due to COVID, so it's meant to be every four years. But in 2021, we did really well in, it is quite a strange split up of the of London. So we came second in uh, the kind of northeast, which is Hackney, Islington, and um, Waltham Forest, as well as doing well in Lambeth and Southwark. But um, you know that's their run under first past the post, and it's you know we try and stand candidates in all of those seats. And as I was saying, they're the ones that tend to have hustings. We had loads of people doing some great, great hustings throughout that that campaign, and I'm really excited to see yeah to see who puts themselves forward and what the competition will be. Um, but yeah, it's those two. But obviously um yeah I think we came yeah second but it'll be the yeah it, it'll still be the list where we've got the most opportunity uh, another question from the chat so Steve C has asked um how do you feel that you can get sufficient media coverage for the campaign uh when the mainstream media seems so biased towards the mainstream parties yeah um so I was really I was really excited on Friday that we already had coverage from BBC London and ITV London coming to cover the launch. So they, you know, they sent kind of people to interview um, and then we had coverage from a couple of the papers as well. So I think that our coverage in London, you know, we have got an opportunity to reach out and get get on, you know, as, mu as much as possible to um, promote the green message. I think we, you know, we're quite excited. We're building the campaign team, and um, you know, towards next year, well, it will really build up around the attention on the election. And last time we did get, you know, Sean Berry got loads of coverage in the run up to the election when we were kind of launching kind of policy ideas and was able to kind of talk to those kind of, you know, as we had those different things running through the short kind of the shorter campaign. So, yeah, I do think we're up against obviously um, a bit of bias, and we've got, you know. Um, to kind of keep pushing for that platform but yeah I was quite you know excited by the coverage we got on Friday and I'm hoping that that will that will continue. Brilliant so uh, I'm gonna just give people opportunity to pop any final questions they have for Zoe in the chat um, but whilst I've got you Zoe uh, slightly related to the mayoral campaign but I guess slightly different um, obviously one of the things that you have done within the Green Party is you've been really heavily involved in the party's work on drugs policy and shifting and improving the party's policy on drugs. So I guess I, I'll put this in two parts. The first question is, uh, uh, I wonder if you could sort of explain the the uh, the current party's pol current policy on drugs and the work that you did on that. And secondly, to make it relevant to your candidacy for London Mayor, how would you want to see uh, some of those um, proposals that you put forward as part of the drugs policy working group uh, implemented if you were elected as London Mayor? always happy to talk about our amazing drug policy because I think it should be one of our pillar kind of social justice, racial justice, um, environmental justice policies. 
So yeah, we rewrote the policy back in kind of 2018, 19 to make it really clear that we stand to regulate and legalise all drugs. And I think often when people hear that, they think they're just going to be able to buy everything off a shelf, which is not the way that the policy is designed. It's around kind of looking at kind of evidence around the harms that those drug cause, drugs cause and then um, kind of putting them within a, within a framework of access. So that's from kind of licensed venues, which you see from kind of alcohol up to kind of being able to access things for a GP or a health professional based on that, you know, based on the kind of perceived, you know, the evidence around harm. But our policy is also rooted in being kind of, you know, globally responsible and environmentally responsible and kind of not just profit, profiting off drugs which we've seen the legal you know the the way those models have worked in other countries and created a kind of two-tier system um so but our drug policy is split into two there's the short-term policy which is stuff we're saying that we'd want to do now and then there's a long-term policy which is like if we're in government or if someone else wants to pick this up we're very glad for them to legalize drugs because you know the war on drugs is is responsible for you know the overcriminalization of black black people and um, as well as huge amount of deaths like the can death death rate from drugs has continued to increase year on year, showing the absolute failure of that approach. But yes, yeah, to, to speak to the London part, there's absolutely loads that we could be doing um, around drugs to make it, you know, to take a least harmful approach. So one part of that is all around, which you hear about kind of a lot more in London, is around the policing of drugs and how the criminalisation of young people is kind of shackling them with um you know, really bad kind of um, criminal records that really damage their kind of life chances. So and we've seen this across the country. It's not um, an extreme approach, but people are deprioritizing the policing of cannabis um, or just changing their approach to drugs. If someone is caught with um, a larger kind of, um, you know, small scale, you know, small scale personal use that they go down a kind of diverted route away from criminal justice systems. Um, so we want to think about, you know, those models and have those conversations. And you've got people like, the Met Commissioner said to Caroline Russell in the Assembly that, you know, he does think that we should be taking those approaches. So it's really exciting to see you know, that that might happen. But obviously, we don't think that's happening quick enough. There's loads of evidence to show that we should just be doing that. So that's the kind of criminal justice bit. And then there's the other health bit, which Caroline Russell also did a session at the Health Assembly at the London level around around reducing drug deaths. And that's all around drug safety testing. So making sure that people know what's in their substances, which is often done in the nighttime economy and festivals, but obviously a huge London issue and something we should be doing. Um, and then there's the kind of reducing drug deaths and making sure that it's building on kind of needle exchanges that people might be quite familiar with, but making sure that people have safe places to take drugs. So that's looking at overdose prevention centres. So they're able to use kind of sterilised equipment, but also have kind of um, naloxone available, which is an antidote to people overdosing on um, opiates. And that's, you know, making sure that naloxone is free, you know, available in the community and with um, first responders. And then there's a whole bit around heroin assisted treatment, which starts to get a bit complicated. But for people who are kind of resistant or other treatment, you can have a different way of um, implementing um, yeah, heroin assisted treatment to help people with their, you know, manage their um, use of that drug. Um, so there's loads that we could be doing, loads to kind of make people's lives better. And it's I'm so proud of our policy. I love speaking to members about it because I know that it's a big issue in local areas. So local councillors come to talk to the drug policy group about issues in their local area and how they can approach it compassionately. Um, and I did a shout out on Twitter the other day that the drug policy working group is more than happy to come to speak to anybody about our drug policy. So do just shout out and we'll find someone to to come and talk to people. Brilliant. So I've got one last question that's come through in the chat, which is brilliant. And it's uh, in some ways related to what we've just been talking about. So Steve C asks, um, if you're elected as London mayor, you'd be essentially the police and crime commissioner for London. How would you change the Met's relationship with the public? Wow. OK. Um, well, I'd love to be the police crime commissioner for London. Um, I think if we'd had a green mayor, we would have taken action on what we're, you know, we would have been really taking making sure that action was taken and that you know the the police were really held to account because it's our London Assembly members who are often the only people calling out Cressida Dick and kind of pushing for that um you know calling out the misogyny and the racism within the police um so I think you know leading with our principles I think we you know it's all about listening to people and putting their voices center to what's happening with the police that's women that's uh, kind of black communities as anyone who feels that they're being you know trans people like anyone who feels that they're being you know they're not being kept safe by the police 
Um, so it's really holding them to account on their processes and their accountability around kind of safeguarding and vetting, which I think we're seeing recently as a huge kind of alarming that they don't have those processes in place. And then just, you know, making sure they're not shying away from that action. So I said earlier that the Commission has obviously said some great stuff about things that they could do. But obviously it's saying it and it's just making sure that those things are actually happening, because I hear a lot from communities in Hackney that they're fed up of us hearing that we're on a journey with the police and, you know, the journey has to end. We have to be taking action now. Um, so I think it is just, you know, really, you know, I think we'd be bringing those ideas in of evidence. So I've spoken about kind of deprioritizing diversion, you know, better use of resources around priorities that communities want to see being prioritised. Now, that's the work I've been doing in Dalston and Hackney is listening to people, trying to get the local safe neighbourhoods team to be responding to people and working with communities in a way that keeps them safe. We've had, you know, lots of conversations about what safety looks like in Hackney. Um, and it would be doing that at a London level, like revisiting what consent looks like, revisiting those kind of basic kind of principles of policing. So people feel like it's a service that they that they can trust. Um, but it's a big, you know, I'm not saying it's something that could be done quickly or easily, but I just think people need to see that that action's happening and see that it's um, that you're on their side and it's genuine. Sorry, it's been an absolute pleasure. Firstly, before I let you go, uh... Congratulations on becoming the Greens mayoral candidate and I'm sure lots of our viewers will be watching eagerly to see how the campaign unfolds over the next year and a bit but I'll let you get on with the rest of your Sunday thank you so much for joining us thanks Chris thank you